Hello, everyone. Welcome back for part two. We're going to jump right into the late 1940s and talk about, um, well, Black artists that finally get a representation on Carnegie Hall's uh, very prestigious stage. So um, jazz was certainly represented as a genre before 1947. However, um, Black artists were left out of the genre representation in, in a big way. Um, and in 1947, we have a number of Black artists that are finally um, represented at Carnegie Hall, um, and a number of them that are um, you know, assembled into all-star casts. Um, let me go ahead and pull up my lecture notes so you can see who I am talking about. So, um, the big event for 1947 is uh, the Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie collaboration that happens. And interestingly enough, Ella Fitzgerald was also a part of the concert, and that's awesome, but not included in the live recording that was uh, released by Blue Note um, from the performance. So Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker are the ones that are are represented um, in terms of uh, archives, which is too bad because I'm sure Ella gave a really riveting performance alongside of these two big names. Um, but Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker um, were decidedly a part of the bebop movement. Um, and for those of you who are not so familiar with jazz, uh, bebop is a subgenre of jazz uh, that was developed in the mid 40s. Um, and we have a number of style points that are um, indicative of bebop, uh, lots of fast tempos that happen in bebop tunes, co complex harmonic changes, which make um, the act of improvisation on top of these chord changes a uh, particularly virtuosic feat. Um, uh, these chord changes are often uh, to far flung key areas as well. So really um, demand that you have a command of your instrument in order to appropriately improvise on top of them. Um, in addition to this, uh, improvisations during the bebop era uh, were beginning to be, be very stylized on a performer by performer basis. Not that that didn't exist before this point, um, but it's one of bebop's signatures. Uh, so both Gillespie and Parker were relatively early on in their uh, careers. Um, it was the second time for Charlie Parker to appear um, at Carnegie Hall and the third time for uh, Gillespie, uh, but the first time for the two of them together. Um, and uh, that's sort of really what made um, this this year and this season particularly important. And again, it's not so much that we didn't have any representation by Black voices before this, but it was a, a large focus of the programming in 47 and 48. Um, as you probably saw from my lecture notes, if you read other places on the sheet, um, December 10th in 1949 would be the first chance that, um, or the first instance of Carnegie Hall uh, televising a performance. So footage of these concerts, I don't have any video footage of them, which is too bad, um, but I do have audio recordings. So I want to play us um, from the most important concert from this, this chunk of time, uh, the Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker collaboration. Um, their performance of A Night in Tunisia is definitely worth uh, study and listening to. So let me go ahead and pull up that first recording.
we've listened to so far. What I like about Night in Tunisia is that it's a tune that is, um, well, certainly a standard at this point. So it's well within circulation and lots of players play it. Um, but part of the reason it's withstood the test of time is because I think of its formal division. Um, we have this kind of like bongo congo, muted drum, slow tempo feel that's answered by a quicker tempo feel. We go back to the slow tempo feel, then we are answered by a quick tempo feel. So we have this sort of what we call an A and B component in the form of the music or structure, the kind of call and response. So we go call, response, call, response. Then we listen to a transition section. Uh, this transition had the um, trumpet and the saxophone together in monophonic texture that was um, uh, uh, with an added accompaniment, so that's it had a homophonic altogether. Um, but its primary focus was to um, put those voices together to kind of drive that section into what we're where I just stopped, which is the beginning of the improvisation. So what we just listened to is called the head of a tune. Um, and the head of the tune is the most recognizable portion of um, a, a particular chart and uh, usually has the least amount of, of variety to it so the listener can understand um, what melody is going to be referenced in the improvisation section. Um, let's go ahead and drop into a little bit of the improv. Let me go ahead and pull up our listening example again. who don't play jazz ask, how do we know when the next person is supposed to take on a solo? That's a great question. Um, it's all based on what happens in the head of a tune. And us usually, unless something is um, uh, prescribed by the group ahead of time, uh, the solos run through the chord changes that are presented in the head. So if the head is 16 measures, um, you usually lop off the, the introduction if there happens to be one. But if the um, the head is 16 measures, that means the solos are all going to be 16 measures unless you want to take two rounds through the solos, right? Um, in which case you two, take two rounds of changes through 16 measures. Um, and as a um, ensemble member, what you're doing is you're following the changes with your ear. And a, in my opinion, and this is going to be slightly different for, for everyone, I think a good solo makes reference to the initial melody that is stated in the head of the tune. And so what you could hear from Charlie Parker's performance is that he referenced um, small motives or motifs, fragments of the original melody 
in a more mm, ornamented uh, landscape for his solo. So um, that's just a small slice of that uh, phenomenal performance that happened from 47 and the recording from it. Um, I'd love to share two other artists um, that are important in the jazz scene in general and also were represented at Carnegie Hall in 47 and 48. Um, we're going to listen to Ella, sorry, Ella Fitzgerald was a part of this performance. We're going to listen to Billie Holiday, um, another phenomenal vocalist within the jazz genre, followed by Louis Armstrong. So um, let me go ahead and pull up um, uh, Billie Holiday. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd like to sing a song that I wrote. It's titled Don't Explain. Hush now, don't explain. I know you raise Cain. I'm glad you're back. Don't explain. Quiet, don't explain. You mixed with some name. Skip that lipstick, don't explain. You should know I love you And what love endures All my thoughts are of you For I'm so completely yours Cry to hear folks chatter And I know you cheat But right and wrong don't matter when you're with me, sweet, hush now, don't explain. You're my joy and pain, my life's yours, love. Don't explain. Great. Ah, oh, such a voice. So during this performance, she was accompanied by, um, well, not accompanied by, but uh, Louis Armstrong was a part of this, this performance as well. We're going to um, listen to him in uh, a separate context. Uh, but this is Billie Holiday being accompanied by a piano. So the texture that we're dealing with is homophonic, right? Billie Holiday is the main event. Everything is supporting her. Um, when we're dealing with subject and accompaniment, that's the homophonic texture. Um, also, the length of a song can all, uh, often tell you a little bit about the form. This was only two and a half minutes long. And so this is really, um, in terms of its complete overall structure, a, a very quick A, B, A. We have this don't explain section, a small deviation from it, uh, where she kind of um, explains being in love and then uh, uh, going back to our initial idea, where don't explain is kind of our central thought and therefore a motif uh, within the composition, but otherwise a, a represent, representation of circular form A a deviation from A, and then a return back to A at the end. Um, we're going to see that as a, a formal structure um, many times over. It's something we like to listen to quite a bit. Um, we also see it all, all the time in cinema. It's sort of a representation of the hero's journey in terms of circular form as well. Um, we can unpack that idea later as a class, if you like. So. Um, 
this is not the bebop style. It does not have a fast tempo. It does not involve quick chord changes, but it is a, um, uh, a good representation of a concise form and also um, uh, a way of, uh, or a representation of simple time that's being used in a more um, em emotive sense, meaning that we have rubato, this kind of flexibility that makes our lyric content feel particularly um, emotionally heavy. Um, in any case, I want to wrap up our discussion of part two, talking about Louis Armstrong. Uh, he was a really important artist in the history of jazz and someone who crossed multiple genres from, you know, Dixieland style to uh, early swing, uh, you name it, he probably had a hand in it. Although like Bebop, he, uh, there were other artists that were kind of more primarily in that, in that genre. But let's go ahead and listen to a little bit of Louis Armstrong. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. And now we're going to beat out one of our numbers that used to swing in the, in the musical comedy, Connie's Hot Chocolate. What did I do to be so black and blue? Thank you very much. Like old Ned, wish I was dead. What did I do to be so black and blue? Even the mouse ran from my house to laugh at you and scar you too. What did I do? To be so black and blue mm. um, So a great example of a Dixieland influence. Um, one of the key components for me to uh, listen out for that Dixieland style is the inclusion of the clarinet. Um, and just to make sure that you know, L Louis Armstrong is both a uh, really renowned trumpet player, and he's dead, of course, but um, was a renowned trumpet player um, and vocalist as well. So he's doing both parts on this concert. He was the soloist at the beginning of the tune and is now the, the uh, vocalist who is singing. Um, Dixieland style in general tends to err on the side of heterophony, where there's a little bit more call and response and interactivity in addition to imitative polyphony. So it's a much more jubilant uh, expression, mostly because of its intertwining melodic elements. 
Um, once, however, uh, Louis Armstrong is singing, we pop right back into homophonic texture. Um, so texture, again, is something that is um, determined by hierarchy of listening, what we determine to be most, most important. Um, and the second something is most important and everything else falls into the background, you've got homophonic, homophonic texture. That doesn't mean very interesting things can't happen in that texture, but again, um, that's how we're going to label that in terms of listening. Um, simple time, uh, a little bit of rubato and flexibility there because we're dealing with sort of down tempo, but a little bit more rhythmic regularity than the Billie Holiday example. Um, in any case, that should close out our second section. Um, we're going to uh, talk about other vocalists that have been represented at Carnegie Hall in our third part, um, some interesting departures made in the 60s uh, in terms of representing different vocalists. So I will see you back for part three shortly.